ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله I will begin by praising Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide, and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of being worshipped, and that Muhammad, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. Brothers and sisters, there are many topics or many aspects of this topic that could be covered tonight. But what I want to start with first is something that is slightly broader than um, just merely a discussion on you know, the challenges facing Muslims um, at university. And let's take a broader, a broader topic than that. And that is the challenge of Muslims living in the West. Now, however, temporarily you're living in the West. But there are challenges that are facing, or let's not even say the West. Let's say the challenges facing Muslims coming into a non-Muslim environment. I suppose we could even question how Islamic the environment is in some of the Islamic countries. Um, they could be highly questioned as to exactly how Islamic they are, and that's another discussion and another debate for another time. But there is certainly something that is happening here. Um, Muslims are in this country, and the point that I really want to stress primarily is that the philosophical and ethical basis of this society is different, radically different. In fact, I might even say almost diametrically opposed to the philosophy that a Muslim would have. Now, I wouldn't go as far as to say they're actually completely poles apart, they're completely opposite, because there's no doubt, of course, that a Muslim would find many commonalities between the, the Western idea uh, and the things that Islam teaches. Uh, and of course we all have many things in common as human beings. The fact that we're human beings means that we share many things in common. But I think what we have to do is sort of put those things aside here and because in fact what we have in common is a lot. Uh, and in reality what we have that is different is actually quite small compared to what we have in common. But that doesn't mean that those differences are not important and not significant. In fact, it is in these details and in these differences that the really important matters take place. So, I want us to think about a word. I'm sure you are familiar with this word, and it is the word D. It's the word in Arabic, deen. It's a word that appears in the Qur'an. And let me mention a few places where the Qur'an <coughs> mentions the term deen. One place I want to mention, inna deena inda lain islam. Inna deena inda lain islam. Which means verily, inna means Verily, certainly, definitely, without any doubt, it's an emphatic way of saying certainly, the deen with Allah is Islam. Certainly, the deen with Allah is Islam. Another verse of the Quran tells us, uh, or the English meaning of it is, I can't remember the Arabic right now, but whoever <coughs> chooses a deen, other than Islam, it will never be accepted from them. And in the next life, they will be from the losers. So whoever chooses a deen other than Islam, then it will never be accepted from them. 
and in the next life they will be from the losers. Let's mention another very important surah. The Prophet once saw a man praying the two rakah of Sunnah of Fajr. And in this two rakah he heard him reciting, Kul ya ayyuhal kafiru. So Surat al kafiru. He said, This is a man who knows his deen. And in another surah he heard him reciting, Surat al ikhlas. He said, This is a person who knows his Lord. So, Surat al kafiru. The Prophet described this surah as a person who knows his deen. Kul ya ayyuhal kafirun. La a'abudu ma ta'abudun. Wa la antum abiduna ma'abud. Wa la ana abidun ma'abatum. Wa la antum abiduna ma'abud. Lakum deenakum. Waliyad deen. Oh you people who are rejecting faith. You will not worship what I worship, and I don't worship what you worship, and you will never worship what I worship, and I will never worship what you worship. Lakum deenakum deen. You to your deen, and me to my deen. This is something very, very important. That one of the things that the Prophet وسلم, he came to do is to distinguish this deen, the deen that is approved of and by God, this deen of Islam, to distinguish it and clarify it and separate it from every other deen. And that it is the promise of the Qur'an that this deen will become dominant. It will become dominant. So what is this word deen that we keep hearing and just keep mentioning again and again? Sometimes we will find the word deen is translated as religion. However, I think that it is very important that when we talk about or we use words, we always need to understand the context in which those words are understood. That's, by the way, one of the problems with translations. That's one of the problems if any group of people, and I'm particularly thinking, really, to tell you the truth of, you know, the Christians and the discussion we had yesterday, is that when you base your doctrine upon a translation, and although we could, you know, I don't want to go into it, it's not the time or the place for it, but just say you base your doctrine on a translation. Just basing your doctrine on translation is a very, very difficult procedure. In fact, it becomes more problematic if the, the language you are translating from is a dead language. What do we say when it's a dead language? A dead language is, it's very, it's, first of all, it's not a language that is spoken anymore. It's not an actual language of communication anymore. But part of the problem with dead languages is it becomes very difficult to know what did this word mean in this particular context. Even with a living language that's very different, difficult. For example, a hundred years ago, if you use the word gay, it had a very different meaning from the word gay today. If you say today, you know, I'm feeling very gay, Right? Okay? You know, people are going to look at you, that they know that gay means happy and this and that, but, you know, people generally, especially, you know, um, virile um, heterosexuals, would feel uncomfortable using that word gay, because why? It has another connotation. So words, we have to understand words within the context in which they are used. This is a broader topic that is important, which I'm going to refer to, of neuro-linguistic programming. The whole idea of programming 